Hello, I'm Tony and today I'm going to be looking at Stephen King's The Outsider, both novel and TV show. Before we begin, let me just tell you, there are spoilers ahead. Stephen King is probably the most successful and prolific writer of horror stories and novels in the world. I started out reading his stuff in the 70s, Carrie, Salem's Lot, The Shining. He started out his career brilliantly with some truly knockout stuff, and the same rang true for the screen adaptations. Carrie was an electrifying Brian De Palma movie, Kubrick's reimagining of The Shining was way better than the book for my money, and Toby Hooper's TV adaptation of Salem's Lot, featuring either Starsky or Hutch, can never remember which is which, was an atmospheric classic. He could churn out big doorstep tomes like The Stand and It, alongside smaller endeavours like Cujo, and by the early 80s my interest in his output had begun to wane. The screen versions of his work came thicker and faster than a serial rapist on PCP, but the quality became wildly inconsistent. Creepshow, Cujo, The Dead Zone, Christine, Children of the Corn, Firestarter, Cat's Eye, Maximum Overdrive, and Pet Cemetery. King would bang out a book or short story, and someone would transform it into a movie or TV show. And so the formula goes, and thus continues to this day. There have been some really top-class adaptations since the 70s. Misery, Shawshank, The Green Mile, but there's been an awful lot of dross as well. The last King novel I had read was Misery, until 2019. I came across the Outsider paperback retailing for £3.50 in Tesco. Only the most upmarket bookseller for me, people. An impulse purchase, I was intrigued by the premise, detailed on the back cover, so I decided to give it a shot. Now the first quarter to a half of the novel is brilliant. King is absolutely masterful in setting up the story, possibly some of his best writing ever, establishing a seemingly impossible mystery as fiendish as any locked room challenge. Set in a small city in Oklahoma, a respected pillar of the community, teacher and little league coach Terry Maitland is arrested and charged with the horrifying murder and rape of an 11-year-old boy. The second sheriff, Ralph Anderson, orchestrates the arrest to take place in front of a crowd of baseball spectators for maximum humiliation and effect. The fuzz have got video footage, eyewitness testimony, and a mass of forensic evidence cementing Terry's guilt. But there's an equivalent type and degree of evidence to place Terry many miles away at a writer's conference at the time the kid was murdered. In fact, he is a rock-solid alibi, even appearing on live TV asking the mystery thriller writer Harlan Coben questions. How can one man be in two places at the same time? Aye, there's the rub. This is a stellar piece of work by King, introducing and establishing believable characters and depicting an emotionally moving scenario of domino-like events fraught with extreme escalating tragedy. Very bleak, very dark, and very, very intriguing. And so far, I'm in love with the thing. Except, about the midpoint is when the nagging doubt started to creep in. I began hoping this wasn't going to go the way I thought it was. Please, not down the lazy route, but more in the direction of something thrilling, thoughtful and creative. It's now I'm hoping for something like, for instance, the discovery of an uber serial killer who has somehow managed to figure out how to look almost exactly like someone else and almost flawlessly fabricate forensic evidence, fingerprints and DNA through a new, possibly experimental scientific process or something. A human monster with immense technical skills and high intelligence, but utterly mad and hopelessly depraved. Yeah, please let it be something like that, because that would take a lot of creative thought and imagination to pull off. What wouldn't take a lot of creative thought to pull off would be if the perp turned out to be supernatural, say, a shape-shifting vampire type, who instead of feeding on blood, feeds on tragedy and grief. Now, apart from being just plain lazy, that would be highly derivative and certainly nothing new or outstanding in any way. Come on, Stephen King, show us the money, baby! Can you guess what we got, though? Some breathtaking real-world scenario or a supernatural boogeyman? Sorry if this is a spoiler for you, the answer is the latter. King has more or less been here before in the dark half and desperation, and it's the second half of the book that results in my realising with sadness that after a stellar start and thoughtfully crafted setup that is one of the most promisingly developed lead-ins I have ever read in a novel, we bullet hell for leather right down the good old lazy route. The perp is a shapeshifter sustained down the ages by feeding on the psychic grief and misery of others. As in the old Dracula and Frankenstein movies, a group of do-gooders band together to hunt down the monster and kill it. Out to stop them is the human servant of the outsider, a brutish cop enthralled to the demon. 
Yes, another frequent king trope, that of the Renfield alike, rears its head, like Straker in Salem's lot, Bowers in it, Arnie in Christine, and now Jack Hoskins, a brainless drunk cop with a red neck. I'm not saying he is a redneck, rather he has a redneck, a blistering rash given him by the outsider who leads him to believe it is cancer, a kind of cancer only the outsider can cure. Who would believe it? Well, this dumb redneck for one. I couldn't be more disappointed. The chase, the cornering and destruction of the outsider in a disused mine, the escape of the surviving protagonist, and a conclusion whereby Terry is posthumously exonerated on the basis of faulty DNA analysis are all competently handled, I suppose. However, my interest was falling away, and I started speed reading well before the end just to get through it. The potential for this book was great indeed. It pains me how carelessly it was squandered. Anyway, next, with the tedious inevitability of an unloved season, as Hugo Drax might have it, they make a screen version, a TV show that closely follows the general trajectory of King's original. The setup is the same, a skillfully constructed slow burn establishing the mystery. Acting is good, characters quite well developed, it reflects the novel in terms of build-up and intrigue. Then comes the introduction of the Aspergery... Aspergery, is that a term? Anyway, Aspergery P.I. Holly Gibney and with her the reveal of the supernatural nature of the outsider. And for me, this is where it starts to fall apart. We get the usual schlep of the one lone believer trying to convince the others in the team that the monster really exists. Just like in a hundred Dracula flicks, no one buys the vampire as perp theory until they have to buy it. So we get the same drawn out plod towards realization here made a touch more protracted by the fact that most of the team perceive Holly as an untrustworthy and unstable weirdo, which she sort of is. She's on the autism spectrum, she has an obsessive compulsive personality, yet is wild and spontaneous enough to fuck the first and, to be fair, utterly banal and charmless security contractor she runs into. Then we get the Renfield Straker, Bowers, Arnie, Hoskins, Duke, Minnie and Slave trying to frustrate the efforts of Mystery Incorporated and protect the master. In perfect sympathy with the novel, it's just so crushingly by the numbers that even if you haven't read the book, it should be clear where this is going. And even though I haven't seen all the episodes yet, I know it's going to go there. I suppose it could be argued that King is adhering to beloved tropes and traditions in horror fiction, paying homage to the monster movies and books of the past, updating tried and tested themes into a modern context for a modern audience. I know the novel was a big hit and I'm sure the show will be more than a reasonable success and a lot of people will enjoy it. However, primarily what I see is the wasted potential and opportunity for achieving something a bit more creatively thrilling and even groundbreaking, which is, I think, a shame. Thank you for listening, whoever you are, wherever you may be. If you have experienced some small enjoyment from this video and would like to see similar content in the future, please hit like and feel free to subscribe. Here's a song called Black Friday. They like to tell you it's a bargain And this time round it's our best sale ever Once in a lifetime narrow margin Profiteering never been more clever Off the optics, knock them back. China ducks all in a row. Kick them down, breaking bone like a chopstick. Black Friday fever, well, you never know. It's a fight to get some surveys When all you want is to get it down you Those double shots don't be nervous Not love your feeling all around you Set them up, glancing light beams off the optics Knock them back, China ducks all in a row Kick them down, breaking bone like a chopstick Black Friday fever, guess you never know Swing like you're winning, you could have a ball no end and no beginning Life
life so free for all. They like to tell you there's a limit And if you want it best act faster Hold your breath then you're in it And you can tell triumph from disaster Set them up, glancing light beams off the optics Knock them back, China ducks all in a row Kick them down, breaking bone like a chopstick Black Friday fever, guess you'll never know oh, oh.